Good morning, Grace. Thanks for joining us again. I, I take a tremendous amount of pleasure saying good morning, Grace, because it feels like home, but it just still feels like there's something missing, and that is you, that it's us gathering together. We've had, we've had a wild weekend, and um, I want to talk just a minute about our first song, because as there's so much unrest in our world, and it's, and it's just gotten so ugly in the middle of having this virus where we can't see one another, we can't touch one another and hug one another, we aren't in the presence of the people that we love, and now there's this new thing that is added in, and it's hard. And so I want to read you the lyrics from the third verse of the song we're about to sing. There's joy for the morning, O sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Wanderer, come home, you're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Let's sing together. <laughs> from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal so lay down your
Hi folks, welcome to Grace Today. So glad that you've chosen to join us here this morning. If you're new here, we'd love it if you'd fill out our online hello card. Just go to mygrace.church and you will see our hello card right there near the top. We'd love to get acquainted. We'd love to know if we can be praying for you in any way. You can let us know how to do that by filling out the hello card. We have a, an all church Bible study going on. Uh, many of you have chosen to join us for that. Um, if you haven't yet, you are still more than welcome to pop in. We're meeting Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. using Zoom. Pastor Duane is leading us through this study of Ephesians, and he goes through 30 minutes of content first, and then we get into small group uh, breakout sessions. They work great using Zoom, and the discussions are really meaningful. So hopefully you'll join us. Visit mygrace.church slash Ephesians for all the information and how you can connect. Folks, um, don't forget about your tithes and offerings. Uh, we'd love it if you would consider giving generously to help those around us in our community, to help our church family. Um, you can do that by visiting mygrace.church slash generosity. And by the way, if you're in need, or if you know somebody who is in need during this period of pandemic, uh, please visit mygrace.church slash help for information about how you can receive help or how you can get some hope or how you can receive prayer. Um, we'd love it if you would uh, take a peek at that too, if you need to. Folks, um, I hope that you're blessed by today's message from Pastor Duane. We have our virtual breezeway immediately following services. You can click the link right underneath this, uh, this screen that you're viewing for the worship today, and we'll see you in our virtual breezeway. Can't wait to see you there. Well, thank you, Sue, for those announcements. And uh, once again, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to our service. We're so glad that you can see us. Uh, we hope one day we'll be able to see you real soon. Uh, well, today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, Pentecost was the beginning of the church movement in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost was a Jewish festival uh, around spring harvest. And uh, 40 days after Jesus' crucifixion, uh, came Pentecost. Now, what was so significant about that is that as the church was uh, being introduced by Peter in a great sermon, um, the Holy Spirit fell upon the entire crowd. And people from all over the country, speaking different languages, whether it was Phoenician or Italian or something else, they heard the gospel in their native language tongues. That was what we call speaking in tongues in those days. And it was an incredible experience of the Holy Spirit falling upon the early church. And the result of that was absolutely phenomenal. Um, we're facing a lot of difficult times today with the coronavirus, with the um, terrible things that are happening, happening around racism. Uh, my heart is broken and my heart is full around these things. And uh, we just need to remember that the church is here to be a witness to the love of Jesus Christ. And this first opportunity that the church had to really expand, we read about in Acts chapter 2. So let me read that for you this morning before we continue our worship. So it begins at the first couple of verses of Acts 2, and then I'll skip down to uh, verse 38. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. And then Peter begins this amazing sermon. They go out and there are literally thousands of people listening to this. People are wondering what's going on 40 days after the crucifixion, you know, about 38 days after the resurrection. And this is what happened in verse 38. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 
Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. What a beginning to the church of Jesus Christ. Now, in those days, they counted men. So these 3,000 men were baptized. There probably was at least that many other women and children as well. The Holy Spirit bore the church that day, and the church has borne witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ ever since. And that's why we gather every Sunday, is to, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, to bear witness to the love that God sent to this planet through Jesus Christ, not only that, to show us his love, but for us to extend that love to all people. So let's continue our worship now, and uh, my prayer is that each and every one of you will love each other like Jesus has loved you.
Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, you are Lord of all. You are a God who makes so many wonderful promises, and you keep them, and we can trust in you. We can trust in you even in the darkest circumstances. We can trust in you when we have doubts. We can trust in you when we have questions that seem to have no answers, when we have problems that seem to have no resolution. We can trust in you when medical science says we don't have anything to give you. We can trust in you that you're with us in those times. We can trust in you when all the things that we normally put our trust in, our jobs, our relationships, our homes, when those things seem shaky, rocky, when we feel like we might lose them all, when we feel like we're standing on sandy ground, shifting sand, yet in those times you say we can trust you. And you proved it over and over again. You, you are a God who is not hidden, but a God who presents himself to us. You walked in the garden with Adam and Eve and spoke to them and loved them. You, you spoke to Abraham and Moses and you com gave commands to them and instruction to them. You gave instruction to the prophets, to Jeremiah. And then you sent your son, Jesus, to walk on this earth, to live with us, to show us in person who you're like. And then on this day, long ago, your Holy Spirit 
fell on individual people and you came to live in our hearts. You came to live with us. You are a wonderful God. And let's help us not to forget that, Father. Help us not to be so weighed down by the troubles of this age that we're in, the doubts and concerns that we have in our own personal lives, that we forget that you are in us, you are with us, you are listening to us, you long to hear from us, and you long to answer us. You long to walk through us, through with us, through the hard things in life. Father, we call on you to lift us up. Our nation is grieving and suffering right now. We have no answers. You can provide those answers. Bring peace, Father. You are a God of peace. Bring peace to our hearts. Bring peace to our divisions. Bring peace to our cities. Bring peace to our families. Lord Jesus, Bring joy in the midst of sorrow and sadness, in the midst of grief. Bring healing, Father, to this nation that is ripped apart by political divisions, racial divisions. Lord Jesus, make us unified and do that through your Holy Spirit. And lead us to submit ourselves to you and your ways and your wisdom and your goodness. And to set aside hatred and animosity and fear suspicion. Lord Jesus, bring healing on our land today. We ask for specific healing for the many folks that are dealing with illness in our church, friends of ours, family. Lord, you are a powerful God who does heal. And we ask that you would bring joy to the folks who are this day perhaps locked up in a hospital or perhaps in bed feeling very weak because their bodies are failing them. Bring joy in the midst of those circumstances. Show us how to rejoice in the knowledge that your spirit is with us and that you are with us continually and that you have a good plan for us even when we don't see it. So Heavenly Father, we ask that you will continue to bless our worship time today, that you will give Duane the words that we need to hear that will lead us into a closer relationship with you. Father, Israel did not listen, but I pray that we will listen, that we will hear your word, that we will submit ourselves to you, and that we will fall down in love before you today, that you'll give words to Dwayne this morning that will lift us up and will encourage us to walk closely with you day by day, moment by moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Charlie, uh, for that prayer. Um, those things that Charlie prayed for have really been on my heart as well. On my uh, travel down to uh, Tucson this morning, um, my heart was really heavy and I prayed for all of these things. I mean, 104,000 deaths in the United States from the coronavirus. Another senseless death of a black man? Really? Every week we read something like this. 20% unemployment, our economy seeming to be really in the balance. All of these things cause our hearts to be heavy. Uh, a broken world, a broken kingdom, very similar to what Jeremiah experienced in the 7th century BC. We talked last week about how that God was absolutely fed up with the Israelites constantly turning to other idols, constantly committing adultery with other gods. And yet, at the end of chapter 3, in verse 14, God said this. And when he said this, it just makes your heart sore. He said, yet I am still your husband. In spite of all of their failures, in spite of all of their restarts, in spite of everything that they did wrong, God said, I am still your husband. There's hope. Always there is hope. Now, in the next chapters of Jeremiah, chapters uh, 4 and 5, uh, once again, Jeremiah is recounting all of the ways that Israel and Judah have turned their hearts away from God. And then we come to chapter 6. And finally, you can kind of catch your breath. <laughs> because for all of these chapters, God has said, listen, this is what you've done. This is how you've broken my heart. This is how you've broken my laws. And then you can kind of catch your breath when we read these words in chapter 6, verse 16. 
Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Standing at a crossroad. One of the things I'm going to ask you to do today during the message is to visualize yourself at a crossroad. Visualize yourself looking down two different pathways, two opportunities, two options. Just visualize yourself standing there. And as we unfold this text from Jeremiah, I think God is going to reveal to you the direction, the pathway that he wants you to take in the coming days. In his second inaugural address on January 20th, 1937, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, admitted that the U.S. had lost its way. And I quote, We don't know where we are going, FDR said, but we are on our way. <laughs> it's kind of silly to think that, but I think that's where we are in our world today. Now, in FDR's context, you have to remember what was going on. I mean, they had just come out of the Great Depression from 1920 to 1929. Um, they had just experienced uh, seven years of the Dust Bowl. And in 1937, there was a young, dynamic chancellor of Germany by the name of Adolf Hitler that was ready to move in just two short years. The world was on the brink of a complete disaster. Roosevelt was right. America didn't know which way it was going. At least that's the conclusion of Harvard scholar Oscar Handlin in his remarkable article, I'd recommend this, The Unmarked Way. This is what he writes. At some point, midway into the 20th century, Europeans and Americans discovered that they had lost their sense of direction. Formerly, Familiar markers along the way had guided their personal and social lives from birth to maturity to death. Now, disoriented, they no longer trusted the guideposts and groped in bewilderment toward an unimagined destination. Wandering in the dark, men and women in all Western societies, stumbling blindly along, strained unavailingly for glimpses of recognizable landmarks, end quote. And just imagine in the days after 1937, an impending war, an economic disaster, everything was going wrong. And Jeremiah could have said the same thing about his times. People had lost all sense of direction, no landmarks. They were completely disoriented. They groped in bewilderment, and wandered in the dark. They needed a landmark. So Jeremiah gave them one. Chapter 6 verse 16. Once again. Stand at the crossroads. And look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. And walk in it. And you will find rest. For your souls. That's the question we are asking today. Where do we go with the pandemic, with racial hatred? Where do we go? I believe this is a verse not only for the people of Jeremiah's time, but a verse for the people of our time, people at a crossroad, people that do not know which way to go. Have you ever experienced this phenomenon in your life? a crossroad, a, a point of decision, which way will I go, what will I do? I remember so clearly in 1970, I was just finishing up my mechanical engineering, engineering degree at, at uh, San Diego State University, and at that, almost that very moment, the spring of 1970, by the way, I had fallen in love with a girl just a month before, so there was that too, but the spring of 1970, I felt God's call on my life to go into the ministry. I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense. 
I just finished a degree. I loved my job as an engineer. I loved doing what I did. And I didn't understand why God would call me after I finished school into something completely different. I had to choose a pathway. I had to choose a direction. I was at a crossroad and I chose to go the pathway of ministry. And God has chosen, has shown me and confirmed in my life all these years that it was the right choice. But that was a big decision for a 21-year-old young man who had just finished college. There's a story about a jetliner that was flying coast to coast in the middle of the night. Two hours into the flight, the pilot's voice awakened the passengers with this announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're flying at an altitude of 37,000 feet at a speed of 575 miles per hour. I'm afraid we have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that we lost our GPS um, uh, maintenance and it was all lost and we have absolutely no idea where we are. The good news is we're making great time. So isn't the way our society works these days? We're just going 1,000 miles an hour but we're not really sure which direction we're going. I mean, that rings with me. There have been times in my life when I was clueless as to where I was going, but I was going as fast as I could anyway. When you're lost as a people, whether it was Jeremiah's time, or pre-World War II, FDR's time, or our time today, we recognize that we have lost our way. And we need to find out which path we're going to follow. The children of Israel under the tyranny uh, in 7th century BC were straining to find their way. Uh, they're looking for ways to figure out where their life should go and how their life should be lived. It's similar to a friend of mine who just this last week told me, Dwayne, I have completely lost my way. You find yourself at a crossroad. So what do you do? How do you get your bearings? Well, you have to look around and recognizing that you have come to put to the proverbial fork in the road. Now before Jeremiah, in his relationship with Israelites, there was other things that went on with the Israelites. Now let me give you a couple of examples. So hundreds of years before Jeremiah, uh, there was a man named Joshua. Jo Joshua, as you know, was the one who led the children of Israel into the promised land. Um, Moses died. Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, and they lived there for a generation, the land of milk and honey. All things were going really good, but guess what? The children of Israel, once again, just like the people of the United States, just like the people of the world, just like the people of, in 1937, they looked away from God. They turned away from God. And so as Jeremiah was closing out his life, he was teaching to all of the, at this point, two million Israelites speaking to all of them before he died from Shechem. And he was uh, wanting them to hear his voice. Now, this wasn't a command that Joshua was giving. This was a testimony. And this is what he said in Joshua chapter 24. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and Egypt and serve the Lord. In other words, get rid of those other gods. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers serve beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, you've got to decide. You've got to figure out which way you're going to go. You've got to decide which pathway is your pathway. You have to decide. The people of God were at a crossroads when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. It was the same crossroads offering the same two choices. The same choices that were offered to Jeremiah. The same choices offered to FDR. The same church choices offered to us today. Here's what it says. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Make up your mind. 
Someone in our Ephesians study last week said that um, they recognized something in my teaching, and that was that I constantly reminded people of their personal responsibility. God does not have grandchildren. He only has children. The fact that you were raised in the church or raised in a Christian family does not make you a follower of Jesus. You have to make a decision whether you're going to follow this pathway or this pathway. This pathway, which you've already followed for a time, and I have to ask the question, how's this working out for you, right? This pathway that says, I'm going to do it my way. This pathway that says, I am going to be the God of my life. Or this pathway that God has laid out before us in Jeremiah. The children of Israel were at a crossroads. Both Joshua and Elijah said, make up your mind. Choose a road. Choose a path. It's before you. You decide. So, take our society. Rodney Dangerfield would say it better than I would. <laughs> you know, take our society, please, right? Western civilization now stands at a crossroad. I believe that with all my heart. This pandemic, when this first started, the thing that we prayed about and we are still praying about more than anything else is that our world will see an absolute transformation. We'll see a revolution. We'll see a revival. That we'll see more people come to Christ than ever before. That's still our prayer, but something is very wrong. Our society stands at a crossroad. There's one way that leads to destruction. We've seen that over and over again. The history of the world is about wars and everybody making their way the way. We have started down a road that leads to destruction. The ethical dilemmas we face today, the crossroads. We say we cherish the lives of the innocent. And then 800 to 900,000 abortions happen every year. We permit abortion on demand. We say we want to protect the lives of the defenseless, but we have involuntary euthanasia. We say what matters to us is the sanctity of marriage, and then we have no-fault divorce. We say let's take up a cause to the poor, the starving, the marginalized, and when our personal debt could wipe out hunger in the world, the debt that we have personally in the United States could wipe out hunger in the world. We're overspending that much. It reminds me of the story in Luke chapter 12. The story of the parable of the rich, uh, the rich farmer. He was called the rich fool. Well, this man had everything going his way. His, his, all of his crops were growing fantastically and they were spreading and it was the best crop he'd ever had. And when he was harvesting all of this and he was putting it in his barns, he recognized that he had a lot left over. And he thought to myself, he thought to myself I wonder what I should do. Should I give some of this to the poor? No, those people don't work hard enough. No. Should I give some of this to those who are sick? No, just let them die. No, what I'm going to do is build bigger barns. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build bigger barns. Later, the Lord comes to him and says, today, you're going to pay up, right? And we in our society, especially the United States of America, we gather all of these things and we put all our barns filled and yet there are so many people that are broken and hurting in our world. We have to choose a pathway. We have to choose a way. And it goes along with the church as well. The evangelical church is at a crossroads. A recent study said that about 18% of Americans see themselves as evangelical Christians. About 18%. Do you know what the largest group is among all of the demographics about what they believe? The nuns. The nuns. N-O-N-E. 33% of Americans, many of them young people under 25, are nuns. They want to be affiliated with nothing. No religion, no church, nuns. We are at a crossroads in our churches. Do we glorify God or do we entertain ourselves? Do we have humility and love towards all people, all races, all orientations? All religions, do we have that kind of humility and love towards the, or do we have this polemic, this political polemic that says, we, them, us, them. 
when Jesus made it absolutely clear that the only question we should ask in every situation is what does love require? Because that's what Jesus required of us. He says, I want you to love each other the same way you have been loved by God. That's the only question we should be asking. What does love require? I'm sorry, I'm starting to preach here. I better calm down. Okay, just calm down. Okay. Perhaps most importantly, you are at a personal crossroads. I asked you to visualize yourself at a crossroads. I wonder what you're seeing for yourself. Is it about a job, a relationship? Is it about an opportunity? Is it about a moral decision? Is it about a spiritual decision? You're at a crossroad. What does God want me to do in my life? I remember when I was um, in 1997, when Sherry and I were at Marble Retreat for pastors that were in crisis. I remember so clearly, I just blurted out to my counselor and to Sherry that I had a gambling addiction. That was the beginning of a long, very long three years in my life where I had to accept and receive the grace and the love and the forgiveness and the healing of Jesus. And it took a lot of work and it took a lot of prayer. But I remember that um, those days, those early days especially, believing that I was at a crossroad. Because for so long, for two and a half years, I had chosen the way of deception. And now was I going to choose the way of being absolutely transparent? That's why you see me every Sunday being transparent, because that's who I am. Do I, do I be transparent? Do I show my warts, everything? And do I show how that the grace of God is, 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 is sufficient for even me? Because many of you are experiencing that time where you're at a crossroad. Do I turn this way and go to the casino? Do I turn this way and go somewhere else? Do I turn this way and make this decision? Do I turn this way and follow the Lord? We are at a crossroads. These are major crossroad questions. Who is Jesus? Is the Bible true? Does God love even me? Even these are theological questions we stand at a crossroad. The thing at such times is to recognize that you are standing there, a fork in the road. You can go one of two ways. You can, you've got the con. You're in control. You get to decide, decide which way you are going to wear. That's the first step is recognizing that you are at a fork in the road. You are at a crossroad. Here's the second thing you must experience, and it's this. You've got to ask for directions. One person quipped that the reason that Moses and the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years is because Moses refused to ask for directions, okay? So we recognize that, guys, you know, that's always been us. Thank God we have GPS now. We don't have to look stupid by ending up in the wrong place because we will not ask for directions. Sometimes I won't even ask Siri for directions. But here's the deal. When a nation, a church, an individual comes to a crossroad, it helps to have good road signs, good directions, a good map. This is what Jeremiah said. He makes the suggestion. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask for the ancient paths. Paths. Now that seems really weird as, as, as this is the answer to which path do I take? Ask for the ancient paths? I mean, in our society, all we care about is having really good roads. Now, most of you realize that in Arizona, we have about the best roads anywhere. I've traveled across the country. If you go to California, you'll find yourself in a rut somewhere. You'll find yourself in a big pothole. I mean, they're all over the place. Arizona has really great roads, but other places doesn't. We want straight roads, don't we? Is that what Jeremiah meant? No. No, for us, newly paved roads are good for our cars. But in Jeremiah's day, people like to travel on well-worn pathways, a well-established route, trampled by many oxen and many feet, lest there be danger, right? What Jeremiah is suggesting here is not living in the past. The worst thing you can do is live in the past. Not being nostalgic, not proposing, oh, let's go back to the old-time religion. The old-time religion wasn't that great, right? The Bible counsels us against longing for the good old days. This is what Solomon said. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? Okay, don't do that. No, Jeremiah is saying to walk in the ancient way, and that is the way of the Word of God. That is the way, the ancient path is the biblical path. The problem with the people of Jerusalem and they discovered the word of God 
after having forgotten it for 150 years. Remember, and the, when Jeremiah was just a, a young man, Josiah was the young king, and he was seeking God's heart. And they discovered the, uh, in the ruins the, uh, the Torah and the writings of Solomon and David. And it was all in the ruins of, uh, of, the, of, of Jerusalem. And they discovered this ancient pathway, this word of God. And jo Josiah began to read it over and over and over again to the people of Israel and said, this is our way. This is the path. The ancient way means that we've got to go back to listening to God. To listen to God. We listen to God through scripture. We listen to God by his spirit. We listen to God through the brothers and sisters in Christ who also love him. We need to go back to listening to the way, the way of the word of God. This ancient path, Jeremiah 6, 19. They have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. Bad choices come when we do not embrace God's word, but we reject it. Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible, it's got like 150 verses. It talks about walking in the ancient way. Psalm 119.1 says, Blessed are they, are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of God. Staying on track in life means going down the biblical path. Asking, God, what do you have for me? How do you want to teach me? The psalmist loved, read, meditated on, and prayed through the Torah and the writings of David and Solomon and others. As he did all those things, he discovered the Bible is like a smooth pathway for a difficult journey. The psalmist often compares the word of God to a pathway. In fact, let me just tick a few of these off. I won't put these up on the screen, but just listen to these. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Psalm 119.32. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Verse 35. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. Verse 59. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Verse 104. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Verse 105, a lamp to your feet. That means you're only going to be able to see a little way in front of you. You have to trust the God, God for the rest of that. And then direct my footsteps according to your word. Verse 133. The psalmist confesses that he has strayed like a lost sheep. The only reason he knows that he's gone down the wrong road is because he has heard from God. He has heard from God's word. The ancient path, the lighted way, is God's way, God's path, God's word. Now, I, I thought of a hundred examples to insert here into my, into my message. Uh, but here's one I, I, I wanted to share with you, and there's so many. How have you been influenced by something that you have read or experienced in God's word? So that's kind of the question I'm asking. How have you experienced an answer to a prayer or something like that from God's word? Here's one of my examples. So um, after I, was, I went through that three years of healing ministry, uh, at, in February of 2000, I was reordained by the Evangelical Covenant Church. One of the most moving experiences of my life. Uh, Sherry was there. My friends were there. The board of ministry laid hands on me and reordained me. So I was uh, available and open to receive a call from another uh, covenant church. But the first few months, as you expect, and I kind of expected this, crickets, right? Because I'm damaged goods, and uh, churches say, eh, you know, he's, uh, the board of ministry says he's okay, but we're not too sure about that. So, so you know, I didn't hear much. Uh, finally, I heard from a couple of churches, but there was one church that was somewhat interesting to me, and it was a, a small church meeting in a strip mall in Chandler, Arizona, and it was called Hope Covenant Church. And um, they had about 35 people. They didn't have much money. Um, but they, they seemed to have a real passion for Jesus. And uh, so Sherry and I were praying about this. Oh, man, that would be so hard. It's like planning a church. I'm not sure I'm up for that. And Sherry and I would pray. Well, Sherry's sister, Andra, sent Sherry a verse that the Lord gave her in the middle of the night. And it was um, Isaiah 58, 11. And this is the verse that the Lord gave Sherry as we were praying about whether or not to accept this call to this little church in Chandler. Here's the verse. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs. Listen now. He will satisfy your needs 
in a sun-scorched land (laughs) and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose water never fails. That was a verse for us. A sun-scorched land. Welcome to Arizona. This is where we live. This is where we are, and we love it. And God used that along with many other people and many other verses to confirm in our lives, this is my pathway for you. The ancient way is going back to the word of God, to listening to the voice of God in every decision we make. To me, that is absolutely beautiful, and it is awesome. But what happens when you choose the wrong way? Well, this comes to the third part of the message today, and it's this. You get to choose. Once again, personal responsibility. You get to choose. Listen to verse 616 again. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Okay, there's one pathway. You get to do that. That's God's pathway. But you said, I will not walk in it. Which way do I go? Okay, this is the way. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but then there are over the ways of death. But, but Lord, this is the way I want to go. This is, the, this is the relationship I want. Uh, this is the pathway I want. This is the way I want to live my life without any constraints or anybody telling me I can't do anything I want to do. This is the way I want to live. And again, I would ask you, okay, how's that working out for you? Or is it, if it's still a good pathway for you, okay, okay. Or this other pathway, a pathway that God says leads to righteousness, And peace, and guess what? It leads to justice. It leads to a lack of all of those things that we've talked about that trouble our world today. Which way do I go? Well, there is a beautiful little movie that came out many years ago. I'm sure you've all seen it, but I want to show show you a video clip of that from right now. The little movie is called Bruce Almighty. Let's take a look. Okay, God, you want me to talk to you? What should I do? Give me a signal. I need your guidance, Lord. Please send me a sign. Oh, what's this Joker doing now? Okay. All right. I'll try it your way. All right. Lord, I need a miracle. I'm desperate. I need your help, Lord. Please, reach into my life. Uh, what the heck are you? I got you. Sorry, I don't know you. I wouldn't call you if I did. Okay, God says, you want life? You want hope? You want peace? You want eternal companionship? Go this way. 
Bruce had all of these signs that say, go this way, don't go that way, go this way. And he ignored all of the signs. But if you don't, Jeremiah warns, there is disaster. Therefore, hear, O nations, observe, O witnesses, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes. They deserved it, they've earned it, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. You do get to choose the pathway. You can choose the pathway of listening to God's words and his voice, or choose the pathway that the world, the culture says, come this way, do this, do what you want to do. This is all fun, this is all great. You get to choose. What was God saying? What he was saying is that really, these two ways are a couple of paths. The one path really is religion. It's about religion. It's about doing what you think is the right thing. It's about making a sacrifice. It's about trying to do this, trying to do that. But throughout the Old Testament, especially in the New Testament, especially Jesus' words, it's very clear. It's not about a religion. That is not the pathway that leads to eternal life. The pathway that leads to eternal life is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the one who died for your sins, that lives today so that you might live. This is the pathway to follow. One of the great truths about the ancient path, God dealing with man, is that it's not about religion, but it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, let me illustrate by two other prophets, Amos before Jeremiah, Malachi after Jeremiah. Now, 100 years before Jeremiah, Israel this is going to sound familiar, was ignoring the poor. <laughs> they were ignoring the marginalized. They were excluding non-Jews. They were very racist. They had a spirit of pride and hypocrisy and elitism. Their hearts did not reflect the heart of God. Yeah, they were doing some of the sacrifices that they were commanded to do and all of that, but none of that was reflecting on their hearts. None of it. Their hearts did not reflect God. Let me read to you from Amos what the prophet Amos said. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. Now it's interesting because God says you should have religious feasts. No, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies, even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. What God said through the prophet Amos is, all of your words and noise and sound and the things you're doing have nothing to do with the heart of God. Later in Amos, he said, seek me and live. That's the ancient path, listening to the word of God, listening to the voice of God, seek me and live. And it's always been the same. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, always the same. And that is to love the God with all your heart. You remember the sacred Shema. They, it was in Deuteronomy chapter 6. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They used to put that on little parchments, put it in a leather box, put it on their wrists, put it on their forehead to remind them that this is our law. This supersedes every other law that has ever been given by anybody. This is the law. And then Jesus made it even clearer. In John chapter 13, Jesus said, I want you to love each other the way that God has loved you. All the other rules, all the other regulations just disappear. If you do that, you are doing the heart of God. To love God and to love people the same way that God has loved you. Malachi said, giving a sacrifice to God called the first fruits should show your heart because you should be taking care of the weak and the sick and the lame and the blind and those who are cast away because of racism. You should not, he says, I am not pleased with you. That's what Malachi said. I want you to give your best. I want you to give your heart. That's what God wants. He doesn't want, he doesn't want you just doing things. He wants your heart. He wants you. Malachi 4, 6, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. That's what matters. Not the sacrifices not the religious songs, not the I did this, I went to church, I gave my tithe, not any of those things, but to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers, to their father and their father and their children. The ancient path, the good way, is the teaching of God's word and that wonderful dance of redemption 
that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the message, I asked you to um, visualize yourself at a crossroad. Which pathway? There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Or this pathway where God says, come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. This pathway that says, Jesus said, I died for your sins, and I died for the sins of all men. And this pathway says, I want you to love each other the way God has loved you. And Jesus, in your life, will give you the ability to do that. Jesus promised his disciples in John 14, he would prepare a way, a path, a pathway to eternity with God. The disciples are confused about some of his teaching. And this is what it says in John 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You are at a crossroad today. Maybe that choice is about a relationship or a job or something physical, and that's all good. God, which way do you want me to go? Do you want me to go this way or this way? But I think for most of us, the crossroad that we face is a spiritual one. Do I follow the way of my own heart? The way that society says is the right way? The way that seems to be the golden path, the way that will bring me happiness and joy, the, the, the path that has, I've come to believe will satisfy my soul? Or do I go this pathway where Jesus says, you are loved, you matter. And everyone that you come in contact with is loved by God and they should matter to you. Which way will you go? Jesus said, the only way to this way is through me. The only way that you take this path to God is through Jesus. Jesus Christ is the way. The ancient way is the good way. And Jesus is the only way to God, the only way to salvation, and the only way to eternal life. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I'd invite you all to just um, close your eyes wherever you are in your homes. Bow your heads. Just try and believe that there's no one else around you. And just see yourself uh, standing at this crossroad. One way is the way that society says this is the way. This is the pathway. This, this will bring you happiness. This will bring you joy. But the other way is the way of God, the ancient pathway to put God in your heart, to trust Jesus as your Savior, to experience life the way God wanted you to experience it, and to live your life by asking the question over and over again, what does love require of me? What does love require of me to love God? What does love require of me to love people? People that are different from me? People that are foreign to me? What does love require? The way that God has chosen for each of you is the way of Jesus Christ. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so this morning, wherever you are in your homes, I would invite you to pray a prayer of asking Jesus into your life if you've never done that before. I'd put a stake in the ground saying, I, I, I've believed God and God all my life, but I've really never felt this transforming power that you're talking about. And, and if that's you, I would just invite you to pray this very simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I've been on the wrong path. I know I followed a way that just leads to nothing, to death ultimately. And today I choose, I make a choice to follow Jesus, to follow his way, to follow the way of love. And by faith, and I don't have a lot of faith, but you've said in your word, you just need the faith as small as a mustard seed. By faith, I invite Jesus into my life to be my Lord and my Savior, to forgive me of my sins and to allow me to live a life of love that reflects the love of God that has his, the love that he has for me. And so, Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name for him to come into my life right now. And for the others of you who are already believers, you stand at a crossroad as well. 
Which way do you go? In the midst of this terrible pandemic, in the midst of the ugliness of racism, in the midst of all of these problems we see in our world, which way does God want you to go? What does he want you to do? Not just kind of float along on the stream. What does God want you to do? What does he want you to say yes to? What does he want you to say no to? You seek the path of God by the ancient pathway, which is the word of God. And I beg of you to seek God's heart in the word and let him speak to you. So Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for each person who is listening and may they be filled with your love. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. It's our tradition at Grace Community Church to have the Lord's Supper each Sunday to, as we gather together. So we'd like to invite you to join us, even if you're not a part of our church. Uh, we believe in open communion, which means all believers have the privilege to be commune with God and to commune with each other. So I'd just like to invite you to go to the kitchen and grab a piece of bread or a cracker and, and some juice or coffee or tea, whatever, it doesn't really matter. God will anoint that. And then I'd like you to listen to this passage 
When Jesus gathered on Monday, Thursday, the night before his crucifixion, uh, this is what the text says in Luke chapter 22. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you. Isn't that beautiful? He is very eager to enjoy this Passover meal with you and I now. I am very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me, the Lord's Supper. body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Jesus shed for you.
Thank you for joining us in this worship service. We're glad that you could be a part of this experience. I want to remind you, right, just in a few minutes, we're going to go to the breezeway and uh, just chat a bit about uh, how things are going for everybody. And uh, don't forget this Thursday at 6.30, our study in Ephesians. Now let's uh, receive the benediction together. As therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so live in him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. I am divine.